Good morning, how are you doing? Uh, pleased to have everyone joining us today from uh, the Coast Salish Zedich speak, uh, the Quangan speaking people here in Victoria, British Columbia. And we'll also be going to Vancouver. My name is Michael Abe, I'm with Landscapes of Injustice and very pleased to be part of Tadaima, a community virtual pilgrimage. Today, we, we are pleased to present uh, an elder panel, uh, two respected and prominent members of our Japanese Canadian community here in, in the, on the west coast of Canada. We have Mary Kitagawa and Dr. Akira Hori. So what we'll do, we'll have a short 15 minute video uh, from the Nikkei National Museum and Cultural Center, uh, Ask Your Elders a series. It's a 15 minute uh, short uh, video about Mary and then we'll have 15 minutes where you can ask questions and answers. Uh, you can ask questions and she'll answer. Uh, your questions, and then we'll go to a uh, we'll go to uh, a, another video of Dr. Aki Hori, and then have some live chat time for questions to him. So, without further ado, uh, let's let's go to that video. Thank you. My name is Mary Kitagawa. My parents were Katsuyori and Kimiko Murakami. My grandfather came to Canada in uh, 1896, and he was followed to Canada by my grandmother, who was a picture bride in about 1903. And then when my mother was born in 1904, they came into Steveson and started fishing. They were quite successful because they ended up with five boats. All the children were born on Salt Spring. So we were all Canadians and my father tried to get citizenship, but he was denied. He was born in Hiroshima. They didn't want to have any uh, Japanese become citizens at that time. We had 5,000 chickens and we had 17 acres of asparagus and strawberries and loganberries, and they were planning to buy more uh, farmland. However, you know, when the bomb fell on Pearl Harbor, the, their dreams were shattered. When the war started, I was just a seven-year-old child. We were told that we could no longer go to school or go to church. But uh, in the meantime, in the few days that my sister did go back to school, the teacher in front of the class said, Do you know this war was started by Alice and her family? I remember when um, the RCMP officer came and literally manhandled my dad and shoved him onto the back of a pickup truck. In my child's mind, I was sure that he was going to be taken away to be shot. Every cell in my mother's body must have been just exploding with pain, but she re remained very strong for us. A custodian of enemy properties was assigned to look after the 77 people of Japanese descent living on the island. He told my mother that she was to sign this paper because we were going to be sent away also. This paper indicated that our property will be kept in uh, trust and as soon as we come back, we'll get our property back. We were taken to Hastings Park and after they registered us, my mother couldn't believe what was happening to us. What we saw was just unbelievable. Packed rows of those bunk beds, 
and the floors were still filthy with straw and feces and our bathroom, so to say, was those trough with running water that the animal waste were washed away. Mother was saying that we were all hungry, but they didn't feed us that night. She had a pound of butter in her suitcase. The only thing she could keep my brother from crying, from hunger, was to let him lick this butter. But we stayed there for about a month. And then we were told that uh, we were going to be transported to a place called Greenwood in the interior. They sent us to, I think these were abandoned um, living quarters of the miners who used to live in Greenwood. And it was just filthy. And we were given a little cubicle for six people where we slept on floors like, you know, lined up like sardines. My mother got a really badly censored letter from my father. That's the first time we found out where he was, that he was still alive. That he was at a place called Yellowhead Pass, just outside of Banff, working uh, on this road. It was mostly pick and shovel. And he was living in a re cold railway boxcar. And uh, the government decided that they're going to have to reunite the men with their families. Of course, you know, we wanted to see our father, but we didn't know, you know, the hell that we were walking into. Father was there for a couple of months, I think, before we were released to go to uh, McGrath. We had to go to a farm where we were assigned. And this farmer was telling all the people in McGrath that they should treat the Japs like criminals. Working on a beet field is like being enslaved, like the black slaves of America. The only difference was, you know, there was no whip. So after a few months, my parents said, if we continue to live like this, we're all going to die. So my sister wrote an impassioned letter to the commissioner, and he came to visit us. And the first thing he noticed was that our shack looked like it was painted black, but it wasn't paint that was making the shack look black. It was the flies from the pig pen on the, you know, on the outside wall. Then he said, I'll write you a recommendation that you will move off this farm and go to the internment camps to Nelson. And from Nelson, we were bused to Popoff. We stayed there for a couple of nights and then we were moved to a place called Bay Farm. And from Bay Farm, we were moved to the tents in Slocan. And by that time, the snow was really deep. I think that it was one of the coldest year in uh, BC history. You know, we were sleeping on the floors. On January 1, New Year's Day, we were told that we were going to be moved to a place called Roseberry, with uh, rows and rows of uh, tiny shacks that were, I think, 14 by 28. The building was just wrapped with tar paper. And in the mornings, my mother would say, you know, don't move, don't move because our bedding would be frozen onto the sheet of ice on the outer wall. If we moved, it would have torn our bedding. And so it was a really miserable winter for us. When summer came, there was a bit of comfort because there was warmth. You always hear people of our age saying, oh, it was fun. It was fun for the children because our parents did so much to make our lives as normal as possible. The amazing thing about my mother is, even without funds, she was able to keep us dressed so well. When I look at some of the dresses that she made for us, I really can't believe that she did those things. They made it so that we, we didn't know that they were suffering.
We stayed in Roseberry until the second uprooting started. And my parents were given, they said, a choice, but it was really an ultimatum. Either move east of the Rockies, out of British Columbia, or be repatriated to Japan. How do you repatriate someone who has never been to Japan? Repatriate means to send back people who came from another country. We've never been to Japan except for my father, and there was no way that he was going to go there. He understood the devastation over there. He wanted to return to Salt Spring Island, and so we chose, we chose to go to, go back to the sugar beet farm in Alberta. The people who chose to go east of the Rockies were sent to New Denver. We stayed there until August of uh, 1946. So that was a whole year after the war had ended. And so that was a proof that it wasn't the security that the government was worried about. It was trying to ethnically cleanse the Japanese people out of British Columbia. And so we went back to another farm in McGrath, Alberta. And we continued to live in tiny shacks. From there, my grandparents and my uncle, they started a restaurant in a place called Cardston. My parents reluctantly went to help them. But we were able to earn enough money to go back to Salt Spring. But when we got there, we suffered really virulent racism. Um, the RCMP notified us that their services was not for people of our race. And we had vandalism, but they wouldn't give us any service. A 17-acre farm that was stolen from us, my father wanted to buy back. I mean, this sounds crazy. You want to buy back something that was stolen from you. The person living there said no. And so they looked around and they found this five and a half acres with a, a nice house on it. But it was scrubland, so it had to be cleared again. After a year, I went to the University of Toronto. I don't know why I went so far away when UBC was just across the waters. I don't know, maybe I was trying to test myself to see if I could stand on my own. I think for the first semester, I think I cried every day because I was so lonely, I was lost, I didn't know anybody. And uh, I went to Trinity College, which was full, 99% from private schools. And here I was just a few years from being given the franchise and freedom. So it was quite an eye-opening experience. I came to UBC to get my uh, secondary school uh, diploma. And so I wanted to teach on Salt Spring because I wanted to help my parents at the same time. So I went to the school board and asked for a job. And this fellow said to me, no job is going to teach my child. So I went back to Vancouver and applied and I got a really nice position with Atkins Alano Secondary. My parents were wonderful role models. They taught their six children to always be generous and sharing, never show bitterness, even in situation where you have to suffer, and always learn to forgive, because only through forgiveness can you progress in your life and contribute to society. Whenever I encounter um, people who try to diminish me, instead of being angry, I try to 
make them understand that their thinking is wrong, um, that they might feel a little better about themselves if they felt better about, you know, I mean, if they could understand other people. Because everyone, except for the color of their skin or the features of their face, they're all the same. You know, we have all similar aspirations, dreams, you know, longing for our children, everything like that. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, and welcome back. Uh, now we have uh, Mary in person to uh, to share a little bit more about her her life story. That's quite quite the journey your family has ma uh, had made, and uh, you've done incredibly well over the years. And uh, I've come to know you and your family, and it's just remarkable uh, what you've been doing. Uh, hopefully, we be, we, be can, we can get into some of that uh, before our session is finished. I uh, just wanted to first start off with, uh, well, Landscapes uh, of Injustice were a project that focuses on the dispossession of Japanese Canadian property during the 1940s. And uh, also something that's unique to Canada, uh, well, not unique, but different than the United States experience. And also we didn't, we weren't able to go back to the West Coast until 1949 when restrictions were lift, lifted and we got some, uh, we got our, our rights back and, and uh, we got the franchise, but uh, something tells me that uh, some this was uh, you mentioned something about the ethnic cleansing. This was was this about security? Was this about something more there, Mary? Uh, was the the bombing at Pearl Harbor and on Hong Kong was that just the catalyst, or was that something that was brewing uh, uh, on the West Coast uh, before that? Maybe you want to comment on that to put this in, into context before we ask answer some questions from the audience. Okay, before I uh, start, I'd like to thank uh, this committee uh, for inviting us to this session. Um, Pearl Harbor uh, was not the beginning of how Japanese Canadians were being uh, treated in, in British Columbia and in Canada. Um, when, uh, when BC joined Confederation in 1871, um, as soon as uh, the second year, um, they disenfranchised the Chinese and the Indians. By Indians, we mean the Aboriginal people. And then in 1895, they amended the Elections Act so that no Asians uh, could be on the voters list. Uh, it said that no um, no Chinaman or Japanese or Indians shall have his name on the voters list. And without the voter uh, without your name being on the voters list, um, you were not allowed to work in the professions. You were only doomed to work in the uh, <clears throat> in the mining, fishing, uh, farming, and logging. And so even if you graduated first from the university, you were still doomed to work only in those uh, four professions. Um, about uh, in 1904, there was a race riot where about 8,000 mobs uh, went after the Chinese community and the Japanese community. And it was um, uh, set up by the White Canada Group. And about eight months before Pearl Harbor started, um, all Japanese Canadians were registered with the RCMP, uh, everyone over the age of uh, 16 and over. And they had to carry these cards with, you, with them. And if they were caught outside of your property without these cards, 
then they could have been jailed for at least six months. Now, when the war started, um, the Canadian government enacted the War Measures Act, which uh, stripped all Canadians of Japanese consent, uh, descent of all the civil rights. Now, by 1937, the military and the RCMP were keeping surveillance over the Japanese Canadian community. And they reported to the prime minister that the Japanese Canadians were law-abiding, hardworking, uh, good citizens. And so the prime minister had that report. Now, when the uh, war started, uh, they had a conference in Ottawa, uh, in Ontario, uh, between January 8th and 9th, called the Japanese Problem. And at that time, uh, the, Jap uh, the British Columbia delegates, these politicians from British Columbia were very racist, and they were determined to get Japanese Canadians out of the province of BC. Now, there was a Eastern delegate, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Maurice Pope uh, from the Navy. And he said that when he agreed with the RCMP and the uh, military, he said all hell broke loose. Um, he said that um, he was afraid that the BC delegate delegation was going to leap over the table and attack him. And that, that's how uh, hateful these politicians from BC were toward Japanese Canadians. And there was, there was another, um, sorry about that. There was another um, delegate from the East. He was a diplomat called uh, Escott Reed. And he said that when he left that meeting, he felt dirty all over because the BC delegates spoke about the Japanese uh, Canadians in the same way that Hitler spoke of the Jews in Germany. So um, that kind of lays the background of uh, about uh, what the BC uh, politicians thought about Japanese Canadians, and they were determined to um, rid us all from the province of BC. And they passed many, many, many orders in council to make it very, very difficult for Japanese Canadians in every walk of life. And uh, during the, when we were incarcerated, uh, they froze our bank accounts so that we had no control over our bank accounts. And um, they doled out just a minuscule amount to keep us alive. And when my brother, my youngest brother was born in uh, New Denver, Roseberry, um, my mother begged for an extra few dollars so that she could buy um, uh, diapers and clothing for my brother, but they wouldn't give us even one penny more. So that's kind of like the background of uh, what happened uh, before the war. And it kind of tells you that we were not, um, we were not treated uh, as a regular citizen. Hey, thank you, Mary. Uh, that really puts it in perspective. And we've got some uh, some responses from our audience here. Sean writes, uh, so painful and unjust, so moving, so much respect, uh, much respect to you from across the border. Uh, after experience so much, has it been possible to have gatherings in remembrance and homage to your, your elders? Uh, I just wanted to say a few words uh, and then we'll go to Derek's question. Uh, yeah, we there are the Nikkei National Museum has a, a an annual bus tour similar to your pilgrimage that goes through the uh, to Hastings Park and also through uh, the self supporting and also the internment centers, uh, including Greenwood and 
and uh, to the Slocan Valley. So Derek asks, uh, Mary, have you visited these locations from your past, like Hastings Park, Greenwood, et cetera? And what were your experiences? What were those experiences like? Um, I had several documentary uh, made about our family. And when I went to New Denver, um, I could hard, I, it was so hard for me to step into those shacks. That was, that was a replica of uh, the ones we lived in. And however, since I was with a um, film crew, I had to go in. And when I went in, I just felt this chill running through my body. And I saw how tiny that shack was. And although it had some um, improvements made for the sake of uh, uh, being a museum, in my mind's eye, I saw that shack the way it was when we meant, you know, when we lived there. And I was wondering how did we put eight bodies in that tiny place? Um, because right now I could put that shack in my living room and still have enough space to build a garden. That's how, how small that shack was. And I could remember my mother and father telling us to, uh, you know, stuff the spaces between the boards because that winter it was so cold. And, uh, you know, the, the doors were not the regular doors. They were just slabs put together. And, you know, the wind was seeping through constantly and it was so hard to keep the shack warm. I am amazed how my parents try to make our lives as normal as possible. But it was, it's hard, it's hard to forget the living conditions and the situation that was there. Just, uh, yeah, just to add to that, uh, when I took my, my mother, who was six at the time, to, to that New Denver internment memorial center and all these years, all those years, she's, oh, I was too young to remember. I don't know anything. I don't remember anything. Just stories from my, my sisters and brothers. But when we when we were actually in that exhibit and she saw the stove and she 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 turned around and flipped up her, motioned to flip up her skirt and told me stories about how they would warm themselves and her hair would get singed on the stove. And, and just being there in place uh, brought back these memories. And going back to that uh, bus tour, uh, UV University of Victoria and Landscapes, we started a, a field school last summer. And although like the pilgrimage has been postponed this year, but something that we want to continue in the next few years and uh, have, have funding for it. But uh, my aunt, great aunt Kim, Kimi, when she went to the Hastings Park, she was only three at the time, but that was the first time being back there. And when she saw those cages, uh, those, those metal cages, she, she it brought back memories and she could tell us stories about her memories of, of being in those. And she thought she was in some kind of a zoo, but when she saw that, she remembered that that's where she spent uh, time in the detainment center with her mother and her father had been separated. So she didn't want to be separated from her mother and uh, would go underneath the cot. And it's just like being there in these, these centers, uh, are enough to bring back these these memories. So uh, we have a, maybe two minutes left before we go on to the next one. I don't see any other questions, but I do want to ask one question of you, Mary. Uh, you did all, you've done a lot of social uh, justice work and activism. You're very instrumental. You were like the impetus for getting the 76 honorary degrees for those that were uh, expelled from UBC in the 1940s. Uh, I want to just mention that a little bit. I thought, I think that's uh, well, uh, something that you've yeah. been honored with the Order of BC and uh, uh, an honorary degree from UBC just this year. So uh, please comment on that. Or, um, yes. I, I, actually, I was uh, uh, surfing the net one day and I saw this graduation ceremony at the University of Washington and it was, I couldn't believe what I was watching because the graduates were um, elderly people 
And so I wrote to uh, Dr. Uh, Tetsuden Kashima to uh, to have them have him explain to me what was going on. And I found out that the uh, uh, American universities were uh, honoring these students who were sent to the concentration camps. And so I wrote to the president of UBC, Stephen Tu, and asked if the same thing could be done to the Japanese Canadians who were expelled from UBC. But it took four years of hard slogging <laughs> to um, convince them that it was the right thing to do, that they were culpable in, in helping to uh, expel these students. And uh, it was a wonderful feeling because I was determined never to uh, never to give up on this uh, project because I was not going to have UBC and uh, I was not going to have the students betrayed again. And so I started this project, but I needed the, uh, the community to help me. Whatever you do, you need the community to give you strength and support. And I also had a good fortune to know the um, um, editor in chief of the, the largest uh, newspaper in Vancouver called the Vancouver Sun. And I met her at a women's conference where I was one of the speakers. And she gave me the uh, she gave me permission to have this. Uh, uh, article published. And so when that, well, actually, that was the catalyst for uh, the Canadian newspapers and TV stations and radios to uh, get a hold of this uh, story. And so the story went across Canada. And I got a lot of uh, interview requests from all the media stations and uh, um, and the uh, written media. And then that's when UBC uh, reacted. And so on May the, May the 30th, uh, 2012, uh, they held the most wonderful, memorable convocation at the Chan Center. And I think it was very emotional for all members of the Japanese Canadian community because even the men were weeping <laughs> because it was so emotional. And um, there were only 22 uh, students left because they were all either in their, uh, well, actually the youngest one was 89 and the oldest one was 96. And we could only get 10 students to come to that convocation because all the rest of the people were too frail to travel. Although we got one student all the way from Okinawa, which was wonderful. And um, it was a, a memorable uh, occasion and I was so pleased uh, that it happened. And a lot of the students said to me, um, we never thought that such a thing would happen in our lifetime, but it did. And it was such a, a rewarding um, project. Yeah, thank you very much. We are uh, very, our community is very grateful to you for that. So uh, thank you very much for uh, all your insights. And uh, we'll, we'll probably call you back at the, at the end of the show uh, for any, uh, wrap up uh, questions or, or notes, and uh, I'd like to move along to our next guest. Uh, I will watch the video of Dr. Akira or Aki Hori. My name is Akira. Hori, uh, my last name is spelled H-O-R-I-I. -I. Some people call him Hori, but the correct pronunciation is Hori Ki. Uh, some people uh, personally call me Aki. My father, Bill Taro Hori, came to Nigeria in 1943. He was 16 after which he pitched his team 
na meron own powered boats, that means boats with engines, not till 1931. My mother immigrated to Vancouver in 1930 and married my father. I would presume that it was an arranged marriage. Most of the time during the whole year, my father was out fishing and he would come home to Vancouver occasionally. So the person who spoiled me and acted as a father figurehead was my grandfather, Hori. So I lived in uh, East Vancouver, first uh, few years on Alexander Street near the Japanese Language School, and later we moved to Heatley Avenue just off East Hastings Street. My parents did not speak any English, so English was a second language. Japanese was the spoken language at home. I attended Lower Strascona Elementary School, which is the oldest school in Vancouver. After Strascona School, all of us would go home, pick up our Japanese school books, and then went to the Japanese language school on Alexander Street near Dunleavy. And we would learn Japanese for another hour and a half, five days a week. There was a close-knit Japanese community with Japantown, and the residential homes were in the outskirts of Japantown, like Eatley Avenue. My mother had no idea what we were doing as young kids. Uh, in 1941, I'm, I'm still 10 years of age, and on roller skates, from Heathley Avenue, we were going to Hastings Park, where the PNE is, looking for chestnuts. And I remember roller skating to Stanley Park from East Hastings to look for tadpoles in the ditches in Stanley Park. We walked across Broad Street Bridge to go swimming in Kitsilano Beach. And, you know, no parental uh, control or supervision. My mother didn't know. <laughs> My mother would give us 10 cents to go to a movie on Main Street in Hastings called the Star Theater, five cents for admission to the theater, and five cents to buy a small bag of Spanish peanuts. We sort of had a freedom of roaming all over <laughs> Vancouver. And so I didn't feel any suffering or, or things like that. As a child going to Strascona School, I don't recall ever hearing the word Jap. So I, I didn't feel much discrimination. The, the Second World War started with Germany invading Poland, and then Great Britain became involved. Canada was not an independent country. It was called the Dominion of Canada, and we were part of the British Empire. So in elementary school, every morning before class started, we got up and sang God Save the King. And when the war started, we were to support the poor uh, starving children in England. And uh, in manual arts school, the teacher taught us in grades four and five how to knit socks. So all of us, contributed to the war effort in, you know, in Europe by knitting socks, and we were so proud. And then, December 7, 1941, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. And suddenly, the war changed for October. The government of Canada
The government of Canada gave us two choices. The East says, my parents' generation. One was the government may support you to relocate you. I don't like the word relocation, evacuation. Actually, we were like prisoners of war. We were interned. So those families who chose that route, all abled men from ages 18 to 45, were forced to work in road camps in the interior, building roads for the whole Princeton Highway and the Trans-Canada Highway. And the other choice was you could go to some place in the interior, but you had to be self-supportive. And I was happy that my father was one of those people who chose to do this. And uh, he chose the town of Lillooet. 62 families were interned in the settlement of East Lillooet. I was a 10 year old uh, at the time. All the men folk going to East Lillooet had left uh, early on in the spring and they started building these tar paper shacks. So my mother with four sons and my grandfather, my mother was responsible for these people and she could carry about 150 pounds of belongings for herself and my grandfather. And uh, the children had the right to carry so many pounds of belongings also. And we all boarded a Union steamship vessel at the foot of Gore Avenue. And that ship took us up Howe Sound to Squamish and took an overnight train to the town of Lillooet. So when I got up uh, in the morning and when I got off the train, I was shocked to see that the place was surrounded by high mountains. And I still had no idea where we were going. But soon we were taken on the back of trucks and taken four miles across the Fraser River to this settlement called East Lillooet. It was a sagebrush country. There was no electricity, no drinking water. It wasn't what I dreamt about or thought about where we were going. Well, there was a suspension bridge two miles up to Fraser River. And that was a barrier not along Japanese Navy. This was also went to the town of Lillard. Therefore, at that time, the first few years, young teenage boys who were high school age did not get an education from the young. I was fortunate enough that uh, men folk built a two-room schoolhouse and there were no qualified teachers. Anybody with a high school education became a teacher. And I received my grade six, seven, and eight education in that little schoolhouse. Growing up in East Littlewood was very, very difficult. There was no electricity back then. The drinking water had to be brought in by a uh, truck, and we would buy drinking water by the barrel. In the wintertime, the barrel and water were all frozen. And then we would move that water into the kitchen. The shack was this car paper shack. It was so cold in the winter that the nail heads inside would be all frosted up. And my mother at least had a kitchen stove. Every family in each world had a plot of land, so we grew uh, all sorts of vegetables, and some of the vegetables were kept throughout the country. Anything else was brought to three general stores in town of Lillo to uh, put orders, and then they delivered to each house in East Lillo.
Okay, sorry, we've been having a bit of sound uh, issues with that video. Uh, you can always go to the Nikkei National Museum uh, uh, website and, and see those videos on the Ask Your, Ask Your Elders. But while we have <laughs> Dr. Hori here live, why don't we uh, have him just finish off the story, uh, including words of wisdom, and then he can go right into uh, um, any thoughts that he has. So uh, welcome, Dr. Hori. Thank you. Uh, I uh, have been reading a couple of books uh, in the last few years about the Japanese American internment, and I learned quite a bit. And that I'll just mention the titles of these two books. One is called Infamy by Richard Reeves. It's a very thick, uh, very detailed book about the Japanese. American Interment, and uh, the other book is called In Prison, uh, the author Martin Sander. It's, it's a very pictorial book, and it's easy to read. And I found out quite a bit of things about the Japanese American Interment. <clears throat> and there, during my talk, I thought I'd make some comparisons between the Japanese American internment and the Japanese Canadian internment. Uh, I uh, practiced family medicine for 48 years and retired in uh, the year 2009. And since then, I tried to keep busy by talking to students, elementary, high school, university students, uh, to give the history of racism and uh, and, and the Japanese Canadian internment. A few years ago, I had a privilege to have a small class of American university students who came all the way to our Nikkei Cultural Center in Burnaby uh, and from Purdue University in Indiana. His students were of mixed racial backgrounds, and the professor was an uh, African American uh, lady, lady person. And I felt very <coughs> flattered that the uh, following year she brought another small class to, for me to give a talk to them. But uh, this, uh, this is a real honor for me to be able to speak to Japanese Americans for the first time. And as, as the uh, video explained, uh, there were a lot of things that happened. I, uh, I was born in 1931, so I went to uh, well, first of all, let me explain that uh, ge geography-wise, uh, there was Chinatown and there was Japantown, and it, they were separated by about four blocks, and in between was uh, an, an elementary school called Lord Strascona Elementary School, established in 1891, five years after the founding of the city of Vancouver. And it's it's still there. It's the oldest school in Vancouver. And so I, at, as, as in the video, I attended Lord Strathcona and then went on in the after, late afternoon to the Japanese language school uh, to learn Japanese. And as uh, Mary said, uh, Jap English was a second language because the spoken language at home was Japanese. In uh, 1991, uh, the school celebrated its centennial, 1891 to 1991, and it published a book called Strathcona Memories. And I was glancing through it 
And uh, I was interested that uh, as children, as Niseis, and growing up in Japantown, we, we played with Niseis. We didn't play with non-Japanese children. So we didn't know what racism was. However, in this booklet, there's a, a paragraph that I'm going to read to you. And it's uh, written by an alumnus <coughs> of Strascona, 1917. And he writes, I'm going to quote, we had a large Chinese population there, Japanese, Jewish, and there was a big concentration of Italian families. So there was always a lot of ethnic wars and the WAPs were good fighters. I was one of the best. You know, those who were not of an ethnic group would call the Chinese people chinks and they'd call the WAPs dagos. And the author was a second generation Italian Canadian. So he was a, a WAP or a dago. And the Jewish people, Shinis and Bohangs and things like that. And this is what they used to do. The Canadian born, English, Scots, and so on. They always felt superior. There was a very definite type of racism in those days. As a single group, they were the majority, but not if you took all the other ethnic groups into account. Kids can be terribly cruel, and this was the cruelty that made itself felt. The author was named Angelo Branca. So all the older uh, second generation Italian Canadians in Vancouver, everybody would know Angela Branca because he uh, eventually became the most famous criminal lawyer in Vancouver and BC. And later on in his career, he was appointed justice of the Supreme Court of BC and justice of the appeal court of BC. So that's how we grew up uh, in the 1930s. And when I was in grade, grades four and five, as the video stated, uh, when Hitler invaded Poland in 1939, the Second World War started. And as students at Trascona, we were going to be patriotic to this country, Canada. And, and Canada was still a colony of the British Empire, and it was the dominion of Canada. And so we were patriotic and we, we knitted socks, made beautiful quilts, which were sent to England to help the poor suffering children over there. Uh, this then, on December 7, 1941, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. And uh, the following day, December 8, uh, Canada and the U.S. declared war against Japan. Now, when this happened, uh, there's, a, there's a long story I can tell you about racism against Occidental, well, uh, not Occidental, uh, Oriental people, Chinese and Japanese people. I don't have the time, but uh, reading these books, I feel there's uh, some similarities. Uh, so in, in the United States, J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI, uh, advised President Franklin Delano Roosevelt that the Japanese Americans were not a security risk to the United States. And similarly, here in Canada, 
the leaders of the military and of the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mountain Police, which is the National Police Force, they advised then Prime Minister of Canada, William Lyon, Mackenzie um, King, that the Japanese Canadians were not a, a security risk to this country. However, it took racist politicians to convince the Prime Minister that we were a security risk. Now remember this, what I just said, that we were a security risk, so that was the reason for our internment. And so on January the 14th, 1942, the Canadian Council uh, government passed an order in council that stated that all Canadians of Japanese ancestry were now labeled enemy aliens and are to be sent inland uh, from the West Coast, a minimum distance of 100 miles. And uh, this, uh, uh, in the United States, uh, even though uh, Edgar Hoover said the Japanese Americans were not of security risk, it was a, a general uh, by the name of John, John DeWitt. He was the commander of, of U.S. Army's Western Defense Command. And he, come, he and racist politicians convinced President Roosevelt that the Japanese Americans should be interned. And I didn't realize how cruel that the Japanese Americans, they were treated so cruelly in concentration camps behind barbed wire fences and armed sentry with rifles with bayonets and, and uh, sentry guard towers. Whereas we in Canada, we had some freedom of movement, uh, although we could not go back to the, the uh, security zone of 100 miles from the West Coast. The, uh, uh, the reason that in the United States, I read in the books that the Nisei's were probably bit older than the Japanese Canadian Nisei's. There were a lot of lawyers already, and there were judges, Japanese American judges. And they challenged the American government that they violated the American Constitution. And this went to the courts, and the Japanese Americans won. Thereby, they were allowed to return to the West Coast before the Second World War ended, before the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So uh, in, in Canada, you know, I've heard stories about how fortunate that the Japanese Americans had properties seized, but they were, they were not sold. They, they were still kept. We were, uh, our properties were seized. And uh, this is a picture of 1,100 Japanese owned commercial fishing boats, which were seized by the Canadian Navy in the first couple of days of the war. And they were towed up the Fraser River to a slough near the small city of New Westminster. And all properties were seized, houses, farms, logging camps, businesses on Powell Street, 
and so on. And the government appointed a custodian of enemy properties. However, and, and also forgot to mention that uh, with this uh, January 14th <coughs> declaration, uh, the government said that all able men between the ages of 18 and 45 years of age had to report to work in road camps, building the Hopers and Highway, the Yellowhead Highway, parts of the Trans-Canada between Rivershook and, and Sycamus. And, and the government soon found out that uh, the people in government-sponsored internment camps was costing a lot of money. Therefore, in 1943, in January 1943, the government ordered the custodian of enemy properties to sell all the seized properties. So they were all sold at a fraction fraction of their values. Uh, and I, I heard stories that uh, the Japanese Americans were fortunate that they they were they still had their properties and they were not seized. However, reading these books, I found out that they were almost in the same terrible situation as the Japanese Canadians, in that they had just a few weeks when after the war started to either. Uh, to sell their properties or to to have the properties uh, under uh, the protection of a neighbor or some person. However, uh, they, they, the Caucasian people took advantage of the Japanese Americans and they sold, uh, the Japanese Americans had to sell their properties for just just a small fraction of the value. For example, a $2,200 or $500 car will be sold for $25. A, a Japanese lady wanted to sell her very treasured bone china, and a woman, Caucasian woman, offered her $5. So in anger, she smashed her whole china set in front of the foot of the the feet of this the Jap a Caucasian woman. So uh, when the Japanese Americans returned to the West Coast, the people who who were to look after their properties had sold their properties and they had disappeared. So like the Japanese Canadians, they when they returned to the West Coast, they really had nothing, and they all also had to start from scratch. So uh, the, the, uh, as I said earlier, the reason for our internment was that we were a security risk. But I wondered why, compared to the Japanese Americans, the Japanese Canadians were kept enemy aliens for an extra four years so April 1st, 1949. And I'll tell you the reason. If I can have a can few minutes. Well, I was going to ask a few questions, if you don't mind. Yeah. Yes. OK. I, I, earlier, earlier, you saw my kind of a reaction that was kind of unusual from what you were talking about. But there's a Andrew Kobayashi was just sharing a comment. He said, Dr. Hori is a doctor who delivered me. So that was kind of <laughs> cool. <laughs> uh, anyways, we do have a few questions here, if you don't yeah. mind. Um, uh, there was, we, we did talk about after the war, we couldn't go back until 1949, but then they also uh, gave us the ultimatum to go east of the Rockies or back to Japan. And as we know, uh, almost 4,000 people did go back. 
Uh, Sean asks, are you aware of any Kibe experiences or stories or Japanese Canadians who are back, sent back to Japan for education? I don't know if that was yours, um, your quest, uh, your, any of your experience. So I don't know if you can speak to that. I know we have other speakers who do know that, do have that part of the story. And Derek asks, are you concerned, do you feel any concern or are you worried about current public support of discriminated com communities? Indigenous people, Black Canadians, Asian Canadians. Yes. So much going on right now. Maybe you could comment on those uh, those two before we, we finish uh, up. If I may get a few minutes to try to explain why we oh. were Canadians for an extra four years. So okay. uh, the, the Japanese Canadian government was planning way back in 1944 that the war was coming close to an end. And they're asking themselves, what are we going to do with these people in the internment camps supported by the Canadian government? And there were racist politicians. I'm going to quote uh, <clears throat> some of these people. There was a very bad racist politician by the name of Howard Green. Uh, in July 1939, he said, quote, Orientals should be excluded from Canada, end of quote. May 17, 1945, in the Vancouver Sun, he's quoted, quote, the Japs must never be allowed to return to British Columbia. Another racist politician, an MP by the name of A.W. Neal, and I think he represented Vancouver Island, in June 1942, he advocated repatriating all Japanese Canadians to Japan, whether foreign or Canadian born. Another MP for Liberal Fraser Valley, George Cruikshank, he quoted, did not want Japanese Canadians to return to BC and therefore also asked for wholesale deportation. The worst politician of all was a Scottish immigrant who came to Canada in 1940, 1914. And he, his name is Ian Alistair Mackenzie. And in 1944, he said, let our slogan be for BC, no Japs from the Rockies to the seas. So, uh, I also uh, know this uh, Vancouver Sun, uh, very well-known journalist by the name of John Mackey, and he writes a, a regular column in the Vancouver Sun on page two. And this is a clipping from the Vancouver Sun dated March 2015. And John Mackey writes, and I'm going to quote what was written in the editorial page of the Vancouver Sun. Quote, the Sun has repeatedly pointed out that during 50 years of Oriental immigration to this continent, British Columbia has consistent, consistently fought against the Japanese infiltration. And just as regularly, we have been overruled by Ottawa and a quote is stated, quote, now for excellent military reasons, the Japanese are being moved inland. Can anyone blame us if we hope that by May Day, we shall have seen the last of them and for all time? Quote, we shall have to admit, this is, this is terrible. We shall have to admit that we are gladly using and necessity of the war to give us a solution, a permanent solution, if possible, of an immigration that was thoroughly distasteful and objectionable." End of quote. Ironically, John Mackey writes, the editorial ran under a slogan stating the Sun was a newspaper devoted to progress and democracy, tolerance, and freedom of human thought. And I, there's one comparison between the 
Japanese in the United States and here in Canada that uh, I was stating earlier about racism towards Orientals. And in 1923, the Canadian government passed a law called the Chinese Exclusion Act. And that act was not repealed till 1947, which meant that for 24 years, there was no immigration of Chinese to this country. And reading one of these books, I found out that in 1924, the American government passed a law called the Japanese Exclusion Act, which meant that it was excluding all Japanese immigrants. It, and, but I could not find out when that law was repealed. Uh, in, during the First World War, Canada was an ally. Therefore, during the, the uh, 30, 20s and 30s, when the Chinese immigration stopped, uh, the Japanese immigrants were allowed up to 450 people per year, and that was slowly reduced to 150 people per year. And that was why my father emigrated to Canada and Vancouver in 19. 23 at age 17, and my mother immigrated to Vancouver in 1930 at age 19. So there was a difference there. So I think I'll quit there and uh, ask uh, answer. That was really a, a very good summary and uh, very, very uh, educational for me as well. I learned a lot. Thank you very much. I don't know. Is Mary there? I don't know. I was wondering if you yeah. wanted to to address this this uh, question about do you feel concerned or worried about current public support of discriminated communities, the Indigenous people, uh, Black Canadians, Asian Canadians? Well, my husband and I were uh, part of the uh, Japanese Canadian Citizenly uh, Association Human Rights Committee for over 25 years. And when we were there, uh, we advocated for all the um, groups that were being discriminated. So yes, um, I always speak out for those who uh, were discriminated. So anyway, um, can I go on to something else? Okay, we'll, we'll give Dr. Hori and Rassi smoking for so long. Is that okay? Yes. And then we'll come back. I have one other question for you about Lillooet, but uh, on yeah. self supporting. Well, well, we'll go, uh, Aki could we'll go, go to Mary. No, I'm we'll here. go to Mary first. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, um, until 19, 1977, I think when Ken Adachi wrote that book, Enemy That Never Was, there was hardly anything written about the incarceration of Japanese Canadians. And whatever that was written was very short. And the government used so many euphemisms to describe what they were or they had done to us. And um, I think the Americans, um, I think it was the University of Washington that produced that little booklet on euphemisms. And it's very similar to the wording that the Americans used as did the Canadian government. And first of all, um, the Canadian government told the story in a way that, you know, we were more or less going on a picnic or something. You know, it was very uh, gentle and soft and, you know, we were treated with uh, respect and whatever, which was not true. Uh, first of all, you start off with words like evacuation. You know, when you evacuate someone or a group of people, you usually take them from a dangerous spot to a safe spot and then bring them back again. So that was really not evacuation. We were uprooted. Um, <clears throat> and then words like um, uh, evacuation. <clears throat> According to the Geneva Convention, oh, you cannot, a country cannot 
uh, evacuate her own citizens, which Canada did. So that is a euphemism also. I think, Mary, you're talking about internment. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, not... Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, and then um, they'll say something like... Um, um, uh, um, just sugar beet project. You know, it was really more or less like a slave uh, situation where we were more or less like share, sharecroppers and that we were forced to work for a minimum of dollars for really, really a terrible type of work. And we were forced to live in these tiny uh, shacks that were not fit for animals. And um, um, th that's what I really wanted to sh you know, share with you, that the euphemism. There are many, many euphemisms that were used. And, um, and therefore, I, I know you don't want to change history, but um, whenever I speak uh, to any group, um, I, I try to use the correct word to describe the situation that we lived through, uh, you know, going through our, our cruel journey. Um, last year, I was asked by UBC to teach a semester um, on Japanese Canadian history, which was, uh, you know, a promised course that um, was uh, initiated when we get got the uh, um, honorary degrees for those 76 students. But uh, uh, we did, it was not very successful and uh, they were teaching mostly, even if it was called Asian Canadian Asian migration, they were teaching mostly uh, Chinese uh, history, Chinese Canadian history. So I, I, along with Dr. John Price from the University of Victoria, we were able to teach this course. And it was quite revealing because our history is not known very well. And I think, um, Dr. Horry, you, you must have also uh, encountered uh, students coming into the Nikkei Center that have never heard about the Japanese Canadian history and the, the true story of the journey that we were forced to take. And so whenever my husband and I speak at any, uh, for, to any group, like we usually speak at the University of Victoria, uh, the University of British Columbia, and at conventions, um, and uh, anybody who asks us to speak, we, we go and speak. Um, and they are, stunned to hear that Canada had done this to a small ethnic group of 22, 23,000 people. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mary. And I know we're, we're running, we're, we're way over time. So thank you very much to the audience for staying with us. Uh, I'm just going to do a, a quick uh, summary, but then I'm going to have one last question here about uh, to Dr. Horry, who will finish it off. It's about the self-supporting settlements. Uh, here at, at Landscapes of Injustice a Research Project, we also have, uh, we're developing uh, elementary and secondary school, uh, school re teacher resources. So on, on Wednesday, we have a few short videos that we're taking part in in this virtual pilgrimage. So please uh, take a look at those. We have an amazing little video about uh, how the how these mm. these are being taught interactively in the classrooms in grade grade five uh yeah grade five ten year olds and how they're reacting to this story so this before we didn't get to see all of that uh that video of Lillouette so um and so uh on our bus tour uh, the last day we were in Lillouette and we just had heard we watched the movie Sleeping Tigers we heard about how baseball had had just broken the barriers there in East Lillouette and they were able to cross that bridge to go and play. So uh, so for our, our, our participants on the field school to know that story then actually to cross that bridge was so meaningful. So I, uh, Dr. Horry, there's a question here about uh, 
why did your family go and what was it was the cho why was the choice given to go to a self-supporting center and what and who went to there and i think that's where we have a little more questions coming in but i think we'll just finish off with this question here yes i think to there are probably around uh, 2500 people who went to self-supporting internment camps which included Christina Lake near Grand Forks, the District of Lillooet, which included McGilvery Falls, Minto, Bridge River, East Lillooet, and there was another place called Taylor Lake, north of Lillooet. And you had to have some sort of finances to support yourself. We had no government help. Uh, all the houses were built by the menfolk and were paid by each family. And uh, have we, if you can imagine my father being a fisherman and you go to the sagebrush country where there's no unemployment, there's no employment. And uh, it, it was because of, uh, of a very experienced farmer by the name of Mr. Tiuki who advised that Lillooet had an ideal climate to grow tomatoes. So my my father, a former fisherman, and other former fishermen uh, formed cooperatives, and pretty soon hundreds of acres were under, cultiva under cultivation for tomatoes, which ended up with a tomato cannery being built in the town of Lillooet. Uh, we, we, I hear stories about some teenagers. They said, oh, we had a great time in the Slocan Valley. But my experience in East Lillooet, it was horrible. We had, we had no time for leisure. We had to work, work, work. Weekends, summer, uh, we, we had to cut six truckloads of wood uh, going up the hillside. To, to follow the logs and so on. So it, it was uh, a, quite a task to to have lived in uh, East, East Lillooet. I, a couple of years ago, or maybe 2017, I was invited to go up to the town of Lillooet and I talked to the elementary school kids and the high school kids. And then the third talk, I gave a talk to the public of the town of Lillooet. Most of them were born post-war and they had no idea that just across the Fraser River was an internment camp called East Lillooet. And uh, most, most people, even though we were allowed back to the coast on April 1st, 1949, uh, most people didn't have the finances to go back right away. So I took a couple of years out of university to help my family get financially more stable. And my family and most families from East Lillooet moved back to the West Coast in 1951. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think that a uh, fascinating story. Uh, thank you, Mary and Dr. Hori of about 22,000 Japanese Canadians who were uprooted and, and forcibly moved. There are 22,000 stories. Everyone, even within my family, depending on their age, depending on uh, where, where you know, male or female, or where they, the role in the family, everyone has a different take and different story. So I'm very grateful to hear both of your stories. Uh, just a quick question from Paul about did the government do anything, the Canadian government? And I think in week eight, uh, week nine of or week eight of the virtual pilgrimage, they they talk about uh, going forward and redress. And Canadians did get redress in 1988 in September 22nd. Uh, there was uh, some there was an apology and an acknowledgement from the government, uh, the formation of the race race, race relation Canadian race relations. Committee and also uh, uh, Japanese Canadians who were uh, alive uh, up until April 1st, 1949. And if they were still alive, they received 21,000 Canadian from the government and an apology. 
So I think there are uh, sessions specifically about redress uh, coming up in this virtual pilgrimage. So I invite you to to seek those out and find more about that. I think so, so just outside of our time and scope here. So, but for all of you watching, thank you very much, and to Mary and Dr. Hori and to Laura and to and to the virtual pilgrimage. The the support staff has been amazing, Aaron and Royce and and Hanako. So thank you very much for everything and, and Kimiko as well. So thank you. And uh, we'll see you hopefully, I guess we'll we'll have our session on Wednesday on the 29th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hori and Mary Kitagawa and Michael Abe and Laura Saimoto. I know in the background there, thank you for facilitating that session. I'm here with just a quick announcement um, in case you haven't seen our session for later this afternoon. Talk story with Maurice Yamasato has been postponed due to Hurricane Douglas. So that will be next weekend instead of later today. Please tune in. And if you are joining us from Hawaii or other affected areas, please stay safe. Thank you so much, everyone, and see you for Sunday supper later today. Take care.